Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Nurisha Syabiti Kamaru Zaman. InsyaAllah today I am going to present on childhood epilepsy. Okay. Okay, before we go further uh, into the topic of uh, childhood epilepsy, let us look at the definition between seizure and epilepsy. Seizure uh, is, um, is a manifestation because of neurological disturbances. So the definition is a transient occurrence of signs and symptoms resulting from the abnormal, excessive or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. While epilepsy, uh, it is different because it is a disorder of the brain characterized by an enduring predisposition to generate seizures or recurrent epileptic seizures which means that when the patient has a uh, it means that the patient has a condition that can predispose him to get uh, epilepsy to get seizures in the future so someone has epilepsy when there is at least two unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart because if it is less than 24 hours apart it is a single event huh? and then uh, one unprovoked seizure and a probability of further seizures that is similar to the general recurrence risk after two unprovoked seizures which is um, more and equal to 60 percent and occurring over the next 10 years and this usually occurs in patient who has um, uh, remote structural lesions, for example, stroke, CNS infection, and then the diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome. Epilepsy syndrome is different than the specific seizure types in which it is actually a disorder um, that, that manifests one or more specific seizure types. The example of this epilepsy syndrome is uh, infantile spasm or West syndrome. We also call it as uh, well syndrome. Okay. Next is the brief pathophysiology of seizures. Uh, it occurs because there is imbalance, excitatory, and inhibitory neurotransmission, uh, which leads to proximal neuron discharge. In which uh, your, is... your pace, your pace too slow, sikit. I see orang tak catch up lagi sangat. Oh, okay. Okay, hmm. sorry, doctor. Okay, there is imbalance, excitatory, and inhibitory neurotransmission. Okay, which means there is upregulation of excitatory mechanism. And then there is downregulation of the uh, inhibitor mechanism, which leads to paroxysmal neuronal discharge. And then uh, because, because there is downregulation of the inhibitor mechanism, that's why it cannot counterbalance the excitatory mechanism. Okay. The next one is the possible etiology of epileptic seizure. Okay, it can be secondary to genetic. The first one is genetic. For example, gene defects such as um, Dervis syndrome, which has mutations in C STN1A gene. And then the next one, secondary to structural abnormalities due to acquired conditions such as stroke trauma. And then the second one is congenital, for example, to sclerosis. And then it can also be secondary to metabolic disturbances. For example, in glucose transporter deficiency, there will be hypoglycemia, can also lead to epileptic seizure. And then the next one is immune causes, uh, which cause immune-mediated CNS inflammation. And then the next one is infectious causes. Um, usually, we the one that actually can cause ep epileptic seizure is chronic infectious conditions such as TB and HIV. Because um, acute conditions, acute uh, infections will not cause epileptic seizure because it has a lower risk or low probability of recurrent seizure in the future. And then the last one is unknown, which is the most common etiology for epileptic seizure, in which uh, it constitutes all types of epilepsies with normal imaging, no documented genetic, metabolic, immune, or infectious etiology. Okay, next. Okay, this is the brief history of epilepsy classification. So back in the early 100,000 100, years ago, someone called uh, Galenus, if I'm not mistaken, the name is Galenus. This Galenus, the man, uh, classified epilepsy or seizure into idiopathic versus sympathetic. And please note that in early days, epilepsy and seizures uh, were, were used interchangeably. They have no distinct border between each other. And then, um, fast forward into 1800s. Um, the epilepsy were classified into grand mal versus petit mal. So grand mal versus, uh, grand mal versus petit mal arise because um, according to the, based on the intensity of the seizure itself, when there is high intensity of the seizure, it is called as grand mal. Now grand mal is known as generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Okay. And then uh, fast forward into the 1960s. So during 1960s, this is when ILAE has been established. So ILAE, um, they want to create an international classification of epilepsy. So, that what, so that's why they come up with partial versus generalized. And then um, fast forward again, um, and then the partial will be divided into simple partial and complex partial. Simple partial is now uh, known as uh, focal aware seizure, and then complex partial is the focal with impaired awareness seizure. And then fast forward into today now, uh, because of uh, many, many um, 
many, many revision of the previous classifications. It gives rise to today classification, which is International League Against Epilepsy 2017. Okay. This is the current classification in which it classifies the seizure with, uh, according to the onset of the seizure. What happens during the onset of the seizure? What is actually being manifested by the patient? Okay, there are one, two, three, four categories. The first one is focal onset. Focal onset is when there is discharge from the brain comes from just one hemisphere of the brain. Okay, it can be further divided into aware and then impaired awareness. And then it can also be further divided into focal motor onset, which can be manifested as um, twitching, jerking, stiffness. And then uh, if focal no motor onset, it can be uh, manifested as um, changes in cognitive, changes in emotions. And then focal onset can also propagate into generalized onset in which we call it as the focal to bilateral tonic-clonic onset. And then the next one is generalized onset. Generalized onset means that the discharge come from both hemisphere of the brain. Huh. Okay, and it can be further divided into motor and non-motor. In motor, we have tonic-clonic, myoclonic, and tonic. So tonic is the stiffening of the body. When the body stiffen and muscle stiffen, and then clonic means jerking, but then rhythmic jerking, regular rhythmic jerking of the body. And then my clonic differs from clonic in which that it is jerking, but then it is not regular rhythm as clonic. Huh. And then a tonic, which uh, means no tone, uh, which means uh, if the patient presented with generalized clonic, they will fall, fall on the buttocks or fall forward uh, on the head or on the knees. Okay, and then uh, for non-motor, now it is called as the absence seizure. So absence seizure can be um, can be manifested as when there is sudden ces sudden cessation of activity, and then uh, the patient stare blankly into nothingness. Huh? And then the next one is unknown onset. Unknown onset is when the onset cannot be categorized into generalized or focal, but then uh, they manifest um, certain defining motor or non-motor activities. And then with further uh, observation of the unknown onset, it can be reclassified into generalized and focal. And then for unclassified, um, there are two requirements for unclassified. The first one is when there is no or, or lack information regarding the season onset. And then the second one is um, when the manifestations um, during the season onset cannot be classified in either classifications that I mentioned before. Okay. This one is a diagnosis of epilepsy. How to diagnose epilepsy? So the clinical diagnosis of epilepsy requires at least one approval epileptic seizure with either a second such seizure and then enough EEG findings and then clinical confirmation based on history and physical examination. So the first one is um, approach to diagnosis. The first one is detailed history taking. So our aim here is to, to characterize the event as an epileptic seizure. Okay, how? Okay, the first one, we must ensure that uh, it is a seizure. So we want to know the characteristic of a seizure. So we, so we will ask um, close questioning of the patient um, um, the, the kid and also the witnesses, for example, the parents and the teachers. And then we also want to determine whether um, the type of seizure based on manifestations. Um, sometimes the patient um, they did not remember what happened during the seizure. So if it is possible, we may ask the witnesses, for example, the parents and the teachers for any um, video recorded seizure or uh, maybe they can reenact what happened during the seizure. Okay, so uh, in the right, I have provided to you uh, the manifestations according to different types of seizures. So um, how to differentiate focal and generalize is that, because remember, focal is from one hemisphere of the brain. So the clonic movement occurs in only one part of the body. Uh, and then for generalized, uh, symmetrical bilateral seizure, according generalized to, to, to all of the body. And then, um, okay. And then um, we also want to rule out alternative diagnosis, for example, um, that is this condition called as paroxysmal non-epileptic events. So one of the example is, um, um, yeah, my, um, cyanotic breath holding spells. So when uh, when this occurs, um, it actually accompany with um, tantrum and then maybe crying. So we can actually uh, differentiate the triggering factors of this non-epileptic seizure from real epileptic seizure. Huh? Okay, the next one is to determine underlying risk factors or possible etiologies for, de for developing epileptic seizures. For example, we can ask about the signs and symptoms. For example, um, if the patient has signs and symptoms of 
um, intracranial pressure, increase in intracranial pressure, it can suggest intracranial lesion. And then for past medical history, uh, maybe um, regression in milestone may suggest neurodegenerative neuro disorder. And then for family history, maybe the parents is actually in consanguineous marriage. Uh, it can um, produce, it can have a, have a child that has a, has a high possibility of having inborn error of metabolism and then medications. Okay, next. Okay, the next one is we want to do thorough clinical examination in search of underlying etiologies. So the first one, we look at eye examination. On fundoscopy, we may check for retinal changes associated with neurocutaneous and neurogenerative disorders. For example, retinal phacoma, intubrous sclerosis. And then the next one is neurologic examination. For example, we may uh, try try to find any findings associated with scissors, for example, hemispatial neglect. Hemispatial neglect is when there is reduced awareness to stimulus on one part of body after the scissor. And then automatism. Automatism is when there is repetitive um, but purposeless movement, for example, fidgeting of the hands and then um, lip smacking. And then we may, we, we may also find, it, we, we may also expect that there is signs of hemispheric, hemispheric structural lesion. For example, slow growing glioma. We may expect that there is positive Babinski sign or um, maybe there is hemiparesis. And then the next one is abdominal examination. If there is hepatosplenomegaly, megaly, we may expect that there is uh, IEM. And then for skin examination, we may uh, check for signs of neurocutaneous disorder. For example, um, intubrous sclerosis. Uh, on wood lamp examination, we may find that there is Ashley flight lesion. And then for general appearance, uh, if there is dysmorphic features, it may suggest IEM. Okay. For investigations, okay, the first one is we may do routine blood tests. Um, because, for example, full blood count, uh, blood urea serum electrolyte, because we want to exclude any metabolic causes then, that can cause the uh, epileptic seizure. And then we may also do EEG, electroencephalogram. We may perform intraital EEG, which means ical means seizure. So intraital EEG means in between the seizure. We do EEG in between the seizure events. So this is the most um, this is the um, the method that is usually done, okay, versus ictal EEG. Ictal EEG, we do EEG during the seizure. We, we usually do this um, when when the seizure is frequent, for example, in West syndrome, if, if I'm not mistaken. And then EEG is actually very, very uh, highly contributing in epileptic, in the clinical diagnosis of the epileptic seizure. Okay, and then the next one is ECG. Uh, if we suspect that is cardiac dysrhythmia or prolonged QT syndrome. Prolonged QT syndrome is not, uh, is not an epileptic seizure, so we want to rule out that. And then neuroimaging, preferably MRI, to detect any such abnormality in the brain. Okay. okay, what to look for in EEG? So we want to look for any epileptic form discharges um, that is characterized by distinctive waves and spikes distinguished from background activity, for example. In infantile spasm or West syndrome, we have hip arrhythmia. There is a chaotic background of slow wave, um, yeah, slow wave, slow wave activity of the brain. And then the next one is um, focal discharge from right anterior temporal spike. And then the last one is generalized spike wave complexes in a patient with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Okay. The next one is status epilepticus. Okay, status epilepticus is a pediatric emergency. <coughs> So it is a continuous scissors that lasts more than 30 minutes or intermittent clinical scissors or electroencephalographic scissors that last more than 30 minutes without fully recovery of consciousness between scissors. So it is an emergency because um, if the scissor is too prolonged, it can actually cause um, long-term consequences such as neuronal cell death. And then um, the treatment, okay, the treatment, we only initiate treatment. Uh, the treatment is um, anticonvulsant drugs when there is continuous seizure or two or more discrete seizure lasting more than five minutes with incomplete recovery in between, which means that we will only give the patient anticonvulsant drugs when we have confirmed that the patient is in established status epilepticus. Uh, next. Okay, this is the algorithm of care for status epilepticus. Okay, this is the algorithm of care. The algorithm of care, the main target of this algorithm of care is that we want to seize, we, we want to stop the seizure. And then the second one is the concept of the seizure itself is actually depending uh, on the, based on the how long um, has it been after the seizure onset. 
So that's why I have provided you here uh, from 0 to 5 minutes, what happened and, and so on. So for the first five minutes, uh, we only do pre-hospital care on the patient in which uh, we, we may uh, secure the ABC, the air breathing and circulation. And then um, we may do initial assessment and, and resuscitation. And then we may check for random blood sugar because um, if there is hypoglycemia, we may treat the hypoglycemia. And then during this time also, we may attempt to establish venous excess. <laughs> okay, during this time, we, do not, um, we still do not um, administer drugs any anticoagulant drugs to the patient, and then uh, we just we just wait um, for five minutes or, or for a few minutes um, after the initial care whether the patient has progressed as well or the seizures still continue after that. If the seizures still continue, and then we will give lorazepam or diazepam IV. Um, if cannot intravenous, we may give um, via buckle, um, which is from uh, which is we, we will administer midazolam uh, or rectal diazepam. And then, if after the administration of benzodiazepine, the seizure continue, we will give intravenous phenytoin. This is according to um, pediatric protocol and also from the illustrated textbook of pediatrics. Okay, and then if it still persists, and then we will consult pediatrician, uh, we, we ask for help, and then uh, we administer next dose of eticobalsin. There are actually a list of dose of eticobalsin that you can administer to the patient, but then according to Without the protocol, if you have already given the patient phenytoin, give phenobarbitone during this phase. And then if seizures still continue, um, we may discuss with the pediatric neurologist to induce coma to the patient, which means uh, we do rapid sequence induction of anesthesia with your pentel. So uh, throughout this uh, algorithm, we will continue in monitoring of the vital signs. And then we will continue in monitoring the um, the blood sugar, electrolytes, and then we will continue to assess the ABC to make sure the patient is stabilized along the way. Okay, and then this is the principal management of epilepsy. The first one is always begin with explanation and advice to help adjustment to the condition, and then provide education and continuing advice on lifestyle issues. And then school needs to be aware of the child's condition. And then in addition to that, we may also um, expose the the um the witnesses for example the patients uh, the the parents and the teachers with um what to do when they encounter with further seizures in the future the the first eight measures that they can do towards the patient towards the child itself okay and then the next one is anti-epileptic drugs which is aimed to control the seizure okay the treatment is recommended if there is more and equal to two episodes of seizures because the recurrence risk is up to 80%. Huh? And then uh, it is very important for us to actually classify seizure types and epileptic syndrome because the treatment from different different seizure types and epileptic syndrome is different. But then according to my readings uh, from pediatric protocols, it say um, mostly most uh, in most different seizure types or epileptic syndrome, the first line drug is uh, valproate usually. And then we will start with monotherapy first, and then increase dose gradually until epilepsy is controlled, or maximum dose is reached, or side effects occur. And then we need to monitor plasma drug level and then avoid sudden withdrawal of the drug. So uh, actually, uh, we can actually withdraw the AED from the patient um, when there is two years or more uh, seizure-free period. Huh. Okay, this is the last one. Okay, this is the anti-epileptic drugs with motor factions and adverse effect. Okay, the anti-epileptic drugs targeted the mechanism of seizure itself. It targets the um, excitatory mechanism and inhibitory mechanism in the brain. Okay, so the first one is sodium channel blocker. The first one, the first example is carbamazepine and phenytoin. So both um, share the same action, which is a block voltage dependent sodium channel. And then the specific adverse effect for carbamazepine is diplopia, ataxia, hyponatremia, granulocytosis. And then for phenytoin, cosmetic problems. For example, gingival hyperplasia and endocrine effects, hirsutism. And then the next one is calcium channel blocker. For example, clobazam, clonazepam, which in, which, in which it will inactivate type 2 calcium channel um, via selective GABA activation. Uh, and then the specific adverse effect is hypotonia, salivary and bronchial hypersecretion. And then the next one is ethosuximide, which acts specifically on T-type calcium channel in the thalamus. Um, for specific adverse effect, it can cause GI gastrointestinal disturbance, for example, nausea and vomiting. 
The next one is SV2A binding agents in which it will regulate neurotransmitter release. Uh, for example, level tiracetam, it can cause behavioral changes. Okay, next. The next one is GABA enhancer. It can be either elevate the GABA level or it can be GABA receptor agonist. Okay, for example, it's Vigabatrin. Vigabatrin can elevate GABA level by inhibiting GABA transaminase. So it can cause weight gain, tunnel vision, and then for phenobarbiton, it enhances GABA transmission via GABA receptor agonist because it, because it is a GABA receptor agonist, and then it can cause a very strong sedation. For plytropic, plytropic means it acts in multiple modes of action. The first example is sodium vaporate. It can um, cause potassium channel agonist, block sodium channel, and has GABAergic transmission. The specific adverse effect is it can cause weight gain and uh, can cause ter teratogenic effects on the patient. And then topiramate, the next one. Topiramate, it can block glutamate binding site, can also block kinase receptor. Kinase receptor is also one of the glutamate binding site actually. And sodium channel, and then also enhance GABA current. So, um, the, the specific adverse effect is cognitive side effects and then weight loss and renal stone, renal stone, okay. And then lamotrigine, lamotrigine, it inhibits glutamate release and calcium channel. It can cause severe dermatitis and Steven Johnson syndrome. Okay, I think that's all from me. Thank you. All right, excellent. Very, very good. Uh, can, can you go back to the ILA classification? Eh? Slide. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, in uh, your assessment, uh, uh, long case or short case, for example, you got an asthma, right? So usually, uh, exam some examiner would ask you, how would you classify asthma? All right. So even like say this one, epilepsy, how do you classify epilepsy? I would uh, recommend that... Uh, um, you, you probably some of you have uh, are using different different type of uh, textbook, different type of material. But uh, I would suggest uh, when you are uh, you, you should be familiar with one particular classification. Don't confuse yourself with too many classification. So when you have this, said uh, when examiner asks you, okay, uh, how do you classify asthma? The one way, or you can say it is actually uh, there are many classification of asthma. asthma. But I'm familiar with general classification. All right, then you state what are the uh, uh, classification. All right, so don't don't work with too many uh, classification. In this situation, to simplify, all right, you this is actually uh, quite a, a, a good uh, uh, slide. This one until five year, you should be able to. Uh, understand the concept of uh, classification of uh, various types of epilepsy, right? There's a uh, many type. You, you remember the broad, focal, generalized, and an onset and unclassified, okay? Then when you encounter most of the time, you encounter the generalized tonic chronic. So which one is it, All right? Usually if generalized, tonic chronic is generalized seizure right, as compared to focal. Focal means actually it just uh, from one part of brain, right side, maybe right side, okay, while the generalized from right go to left or left go to right. That's the definition of generalized, the uh, abnormal brain activity passes through, you know, brain hemisphere is divided right and left, huh? okay, so that's what we mean by generalized, it travels uh, through the other hemisphere, then it becomes generalized as compared to focal, it's actually only uh, one side, that's why when uh, we perform EEG. Okay, can you uh, can you go to the uh, EEG uh, diagram? Okay, you see, this is how left and right. Okay, so when when uh, with regards of investigation, again in your assessment exam, right? So what investigation you want to do? There are many ways. I mean, for 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 third year, you can you you can say that, uh, but but don't say what investigation you want to do. Full blood count, uh, and then you're quiet, right? So uh, you should be uh, confident enough to say two options. One, whether you want to say, I want to do full blood count, uh, renal profile, or serum electrolyte, even function test, dengue serology test, example, and then you explain later. Right? Or you can say that full blood count, I want to look for white blood cell differential. 
neutrophilia, suggestive of bacterial lymphocytosis, suggestive of viral example. It's not like uh, I want to do full blood test to look for infection. There's no such thing as uh, you can't look for infection in your full blood count, isn't it? Right? So, want to look for infection is actually uh, blood culture. Blood culture, why to do blood culture? Blood culture, I would like to, I want to do it to possibly isolate the organism uh, likely causing this problem. So, uh, this is what uh, the, the simplified uh, rationale. That's why I, 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 I expect you to, what is expected finding? All right, you, 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 what you expect to find simplified. So, in EEG just now, okay, what, how, why you want to perform EEG? I want to look at the abnormal epileptic wave or abnormal brain wave. Simple, yeah. ECG to look at the abnormal rate, rhythm, axis. Okay, so the, the, the broad uh, uh, concept to understand so that when you people ask you, uh, you, be able, you, you should be able to uh, uh, rationalize. MRL CT scan, expect to look at the space occupying condition. Okay, abnormal brain structure. Okay, that's the rationale. So, you look at the EEG diagram. You do it left and right. That's how you differentiate, how you would be able to determine whether it is a focal or generalized from EEG. Okay. All right. Okay, the next slide. Okay, I mean, it, it, in, in, your, in your reading, uh, I think third year, really we give you uh, the syndromic, uh, uh, what I call this, uh, seizure. Like you probably need to know the uh, infantile spasm may come with the EEG picture. Uh, what, what is it? But uh, we want you to understand the concept. So this has been uh, uh, presented ex uh, excellently by your, your, by your colleague. Eh? I think very good. Any question related to epilepsy? Actually, if you ask me, uh, this, uh, this slide is like very good. You just read this and it covers everything already, right? And then uh, in, with regards of the therapeutic, again, remember the concept and group. Okay, this one frequently comes in your... Uh, multiple choice, right? Then uh, just remember the specific, uh, if, you, if you got me for exam, I don't, uh, I don't accept uh, what are the, uh, we, we are, the question will be, apart from nausea, rash and vomiting, right? what are the side effects of this drug? Usually that question you will ask. Uh, you need a specific, cannot lah, nausea, rash, vomiting. Uh, you need to know the specific uh, side effect, uh, all right? So, very good. Any question related to CG and epilepsy? Very good. I think it's excellent presentation. Okay. Any question? Otherwise, we can present at the end. Okay. Then the next one. Can everyone see this slide? Yes. Okay. So I'll start. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum I am Sarah Pisa. I will be presenting on Toba Caesar. Okay. Um, so Toba Caesar. Okay, the definition of Toba Caesar. Okay, Trobus disease can be defined as a seizure that commonly occurs in child between the age of six, year, uh, six months to six years with a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius or higher that is not due to any scanner's infection or metabolic imbalance or uh, and the patient have absence of any history of prior Trobus seizure before. Usually, uh, most cases of Trobus seizure are benign and self limiting and the peak incidence of progress disease are usually around 12 and 18 months. Um, okay. Next, we will look at the classification. So progress disease can be classified into simple and complex, in which both of these have different characteristics. As for simple uh, progress disease, um, it is generalized in nature. So the child may have a tonic-tonic uh, kind of seizure, 
and commonly may involve facial and also respiratory muscle. And the duration of a simple proboscis is usually less than 15 minutes, usually around five minutes. And it doesn't have any tendency to recur within 24 hours. Uh, and usually after the episode of seizure, um, the child will return to the baseline normal behavior and regain their consciousness within minutes after the seizure. As for complex by seizure, uh, usually it is focal in nature, so the child will have um, a seizure uh, only on a part of their body, and usually it may also just um, involving a limb. Uh, usually for um, complex progress seizure, it lasts longer and it lasts for more than 50 minutes. And it has a tendency to recur within 24 hours. So within 24 hours, they may experience like more than one episode of a uh, seizure. And usually after the seizure attack, they have they will have thoughts paralysis in which um they will uh the muscle uh, the the limb that involve um will be paralyzed or weakened after the uh, attack of seizure. Okay. So next we look at the pathophysiology of probiotic seizure. Um, the part of is, is actually remain unclear that uh, it is postulated that proboscis is resulted from a vulnerability of the developing skin as to the effect of fever in combination with an underlying genetic predisposition and environment factor. So this part, uh, usually they have uh, they already have the genetic susceptibilities such as having GABA A receptor subunit mutation or sodium channel subunit mutation. And then if there is any infection, for example, if they were being infected with herpes, human herpes virus, it, or um, influenza virus, then it will cause the uh, increased production of uh, interleukin-1 beta and it will cause fever. So when there's elevated temperature in this child, uh, together with the genetic susceptibility that the child already have, it will impact on the ion channel and then it will cause increased production of glutamate and reduce production of GABA. So there will be increased excitability and synchronization of activity. So all of this event later on will cause simple, simple to bile seizure. Um, okay. And uh, so the patient will come with the um, clinical manifestation just like what I have um, mentioned before. Okay, so next. We look at the diagnosis and investigation. Um, proboscis is a clinical diagnosis. So um, usually if the patient comes with a history of simple proboscis, they don't require any diagnosis testing. Um, um, one of the investigations that is still controversial to be done is lumbar puncture. It is actually uh, being done to rule out meningitis and encephalitis. However, I will um, Elaborate about this um, later on after this. Um, next is electroencephalogram. It is actually not indicated for multiple recurrence or complex proboscis because um, it will not even predict any future recurrence of proboscis or epilepsy, even though the result is abnormal. Um, but we may do blood studies, um, such as a full blood count to check for leukocytosis that indicate infections. And we may also do blood glucose to check if the patient is hypoglycemic. Um, and we may look for, uh, we may do BUS to check for hyponatremia because usually patients with hyponatremia, they have the tendency to, uh, to have recurrence. And because hyponatremia able to modify the seizure threshold um, in the children. And for next we can do blood glucose uh, to identify causative organisms. However, all these blood studies are dependent on the clinical assessment of the individual patient. Okay, so next, we will look at the um, indications for lumbar puncture. Um, lumbar puncture is unnecessary in most uh, well occurring children, especially if uh, they have a simple um, progress and then they just um, return to their normal baseline again, so it is not usually indicated. Uh, however, according to AAP, it must be done if there is any sign and symptom that suggests intracranial infection, such as having altered consciousness, natural rigidity, or petechial rash. Or if the uh, child has persistent lethargy and was not fully interactive. And it should also be considered if uh, the age of child is less than 12 months, especially if the child has not received any hemophilus influenza type B and pneumococcal immunization yet. Because uh, these organisms are 
usually the causative organism of meningitis. And um, it, it should also be considered if the child have a prior antibiotic therapy before because the usage of, the usage of antibiotic may actually mask the signs and symptoms of meningitis. So according to several studies, um, um, the usage of um, doing lumbar puncture in children with fibrous seizure actually have low yield, low yield of, yeah. And so um, it can be concluded that, um, it, um, it can be concluded that lumbar puncture may be indicated in children if they come with other intracranial infections. Um, because usually um, meningitis um, will not come with a sole presentation of seizure. Yeah. Okay, so next, for complication, um, proboscis seizure have, um, have the tendency for recurrence and also epilepsy. So recurrence usually occur in 30% of the children uh, that have uh, proboscis seizure. And the risk factor for recurrence are having family history of proboscis seizure each less than 18 months, uh, having low degree of fever during first robust seizure and having short duration between the onset of fever and also the seizure. Um, for epilepsy, the risk factors are having neuron developmental abnormality, having complex robust seizure or family history of epilepsy. Other complications such as having neurological outcomes, uh, for example, neurological deficit, intellectual impairment, behavior disorder, are uh, somehow rare in the case of robust seizure. Okay, next, I will look at the principle of management. Um, okay. uh, first, we have to take a tour of uh, history and also to a uh, tour of physical examination on the patient to uh, enable us to distinguish whether this child having proboscis or is there any other um, underlying etiology for these children. Okay. Um, and then we may manage the acute proboscis by giving um, benzodiazepam. Um, we can give it intravenously, but if the patient is not cooperative, then we may also give it rectally. And then we have to determine the risk factor for recurrence and estimate risk of risk recurrence for the progress user. And it is also important for us to counsel the parents about the risk of recurrence and how to provide risk aid and manage people because um, we have to uh, reduce the parental anxiety. We have to try to reassure the parents that this condition is actually benign and it has favorable outcome. And next, we have to determine the risk factor for later epilepsy. So if the patient have low risk for later epilepsy, then um, she, uh, then the child uh, doesn't need any therapy or investigation. But if um, the child have intermediate or high risk of epilepsy, then we may consider EEG and imaging. And we may also consider intermittent oral diazepam or in exceptional cases, therica, continuous therapy. Uh, usually, um, chat with uh, progress user, we don't um, admit the patient. Uh, however, there are a few indications, um, such as uh, to exclude intracranial pathology, uh, having fear of recurrent seizures, and, and to investigate and treat the cause of fever besides meningitis and colitis, and also to allay parental anxiety, especially if they are staying for, far from the hospital. So, I guess um, that's the end of my presentation. All right, very good. Very good. Um, okay. Nothing much. Any question to the presenter? Things are quite clear. You can always uh, ask a question later at the end. Uh, okay. Continue with the next uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, can you guys uh, hear me? Okay, so yes. okay, thank you. Okay, so Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Afiq Nakudin, and insyaAllah I will cover on topic meningitis and encephalitis. Okay, next. Okay, so firstly for the definition, uh, meningitis basically means the inflammation of the meninges, which is the covering of the brain and the spinal cord why the encephalitis means the inflammation of the brain parenchyma, basically the brain itself. 
So to simply put, uh, the causes of the uh, meningitis can be divided into infective causes or non-infective causes, which is uh, the viral infection or also known as the aseptic meningitis is the most common among them. And uh, next is the bacterial infection, which is uh, more severe than the viral infection. And, uh, and it has the higher rate of mortality and more than 10% uh, will suffer the long-term neurological complication. And the other causes like uh, from the fungus and from the parasitic infection is rare. And the non-infective causes can be due to autoimmune disorder like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, or uh, from the drug like uh, NSAIDs and intravenous immunoglobulin, or can be due to malignancy or hemorrhage. So for the encephalitis, it is uh, highest among the infant, which is uh, below than one year. And for the infective uh, causes, it is uh, more common uh, due to uh, herpes simplex virus. And it can also be due to enterovirus, influenza, varicella zoster, and so on. So for the non-infective causes, it can be also due to SLE, vasculitis, and neoplasm, whether it is primary or metastasis from lung and breast, for the uh, and due to metabolic, which is uh, rise syndromes, uh, hypoglycemia, hepatic or renal encephalopathy. Right, next. Okay, so uh, this slide is uh, basically I just uh, put uh, the for bad, uh, acute man, uh, bacterial meningitis. Uh, we, it is uh, can be divided into the age of the uh, patients. So for the first three months, it is uh, more common uh, due to group B streptococcus, E. coli or Listeria monocytogen. And uh, for the patient uh, within the one month until six years, this uh, likely due to Neisseria meningitis, uh, strep pneumonia or uh, Hemophilus influenza. And for the patients more than six years, uh, it can be due to Neisseria meningitis or strep pneumonia. For the viral meningitis, can be due to enterovirus, arbovirus, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, and so on. And for the fungus and parasitic, uh, like I said before, eh? so for the encephalitis, the uh, the uh, diagram uh, on the right is uh, basically just the extended version of the uh, causes that I had said before. So you can check it out later. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is uh, one of the important part, which is the pathogenesis. So for meningitis, uh, especially bacterial meningitis, it can be divided into five steps. Uh, started with the colonization of the mucous membrane, which is the nasopharynx is the common site for colonization. So some of the pathogen uh, may possess uh, surface components such as fimbriae or pili to facilitate the adhesion. And some of them also have protease to inactivate the mucosal antibody. So the colonization uh, later contribute to invasion of the pathogen into the bloodstream. And invasion of the bloodstream is uh, mediated due to the various interaction between the host and the pathogens such as the host is asplenia, uh, nosplen, or in immunodeficiency state or have previous viral infections such as uh, influenza. So uh, next, the pathogen survival in the bloodstream. So uh, some of the bacteria such as strep pneumonia and Neisseria meningitis poses polysaccharide capsule uh, that can prevent them from the phagocytosis. And some of them may possess the protein binding such as h binding protein that target the specific com uh, complement components to avoid the activation of the complement system. So as this bacteria continue to survive within the blood vessel, it causes the bacteremia and this high amount of bacteria is responsible for breaching for uh, the blood brain barrier. As for the next step, the meningeal invasion, the pathogen gain entry to the CSF through the coroid plates and the meninges. Then the pathogen circulate into the extracerebral CSF and the sideroid space. So within the CSF, the pathogen can multiply to the high concentration because uh, there is inadequate uh, humoral immunity such as antibody and complement system within the CSF. So this result in subsequent development of the inflammatory process. 
So there will be strong inflammatory response uh, toward the infection within the CSF, uh, especially leukocyte. And it is uh, characterized by the neutrophil infiltration, increased uh, vascular permeability, alteration of the blood brain barrier, and the vascular thrombosis. So this uh, injury, brain injury, uh, is likely occur due to host reaction rather than the bacteria themselves. And for the encephalitis, uh, that will be due to three ways, uh, which is firstly the direct invasion of the brain uh, by the neurotoxic uh, virus, such as herpes simplex virus, or it can be by uh, post-infectious encephalopathy, meaning uh, that is a delayed brain swelling after the neural immunological response to an antigen, uh, which is virus. So this can be seen uh, in the chicken pox patients and it can be due to slow virus infection like in HIV patient and subacute sclerosing pen encephalitis, SSPE, uh, in the measles. Okay, next. Okay, so regarding the clinical features, uh, basically the clinical features for them is quite similar, but it is uh, not reliable to make uh, the diagnosis based on the clinical features only. So for the meningitis, <clears throat> the patient might have the fever, upper respiratory tract or GI symptom before the other neurological sign. And similarly in the uh, encephalitis, the patient also might have fever, nausea, and upper respiratory system as the manifestation of the viremia. For the meningeal irritation uh, sign, it is due to inflammation that will produce the sign where the patient might have the neck stiffness or nuclear rigidity, positive Kernick and Brzezinski sign, photophobia or headache. And in encephalitis, the patient can also exhibit this symptom but with less severity. Next, um, due to meningeal congestion, and inflammatory exudate, there will be increase in the intracranial pressure. So the patient may exhibit the vomiting, bulging fontanelle, uh, altered metastasis, uh, diplopia, papillary edema, and so on. So again, there are also some manifestation in uh, of increased ICP in encephalitis, but it is uh, less severe than the meningitis. And both of them uh, will uh, can exhibit the focal neurologic uh, sign. Uh, usually occur due to vascular occlusion, such as seizure, focal paralysis, and disturbed consciousness, uh, conscious levels, such as coma or drowsiness. And for the meningitis, there are, and for the meningitis, there are also uh, cutaneous signs such as petechiae, purpura, erythematous, uh, macular rash, and lastly, the patient can have the non-specific sign also like uh, fever, lethargy, poor feeding, anorexia, headache. Nigeria and so on. And for the encephalitis, uh, the patient can manifest the symptom of complication like seizure, mental retardation, cerebral palsy, and auditory, visual, speech, and behavioral abnormalities. Uh, next. Uh, next. Okay, uh, so for the diagnosis, how to diagnose uh, these two problems. Uh, basically, like I said before, we cannot establish the diagnosis uh, based on the history and clinical manifestation. However, we can have the rough idea on what is going on. For history, we need to careful ask uh, history such as the immunization record, the travel and juro geographical uh, history and we can note for any risk factors such as immunodeficiency, asplenia and cochlear implantation. And uh, for the and if the patient uh, manifests the common symptom symptom like fever, headache, neck stiffness, altered mental status, or during examination we can find the po uh, positive Kernick and Brzezinski sign, uh, like I put in the uh, in the diagram uh, on the right. So basically, the positive uh, the positive Kernick sign is where the patient cannot straighten the leg when the hip is flexed to the ninety degree. Why Brzezinski sign is when the patient hips and knee flex when the neck is flat when the neck is flat. So, however, the absence of absence of the nuclear rigidity, the Kernick and Brzezinski sign should not uh, used to exclude the meningitis. And uh, to have bet, uh, to establish the diagnosis, we need to do the neuroimaging studies like EEG, CT scan, or MRI, and we can do the lumbar puncture to examine the CSF. 
Okay, so next. Okay, uh, for the investigation, it is uh, basically the same. So, uh, like I said before, we can do the lumbar puncture to, to get the uh, CSF examination. So, uh, I put the table on the right. So, in the bacterial meningitis, uh, the, uh, the CSF will appear to, uh, to be and the cell will be higher than the normal, like uh, 10 to 10,000 uh, cell. So it is uh, basically predominantly by the polymorphonuclear cell. And uh, there will be high, uh, high content of the protein, but low glucose. So for the viral, uh, the, appearance can, the appearance can be clear or slightly turbid. And the cell is uh, higher than the normal, but less than the viral, uh, less than the bacteria. And the type can be early in the early stage. It will be predominantly by the polymorphonuclear cell, and later will be, uh, and later the mononuclear cell will be, uh, will be more. So the protein can be normal or uh, slightly increased, and the glucose will be within the normal. So for the TB or fungus, uh, fungi, <coughs> the uh, the CSF will appear clear or slightly turbid. And the cell also more than normal, but uh, uh, less than the bacteria meningitis. So the type will be also the same, the pre early stage predominantly by the PNM and then will be by the mononuclear cell. So the protein will be high and the glucose will be low than normal. So for the encephalitis, the, it will, the CSF will appear as clear and the cell will be uh, slightly increased, but it will be predominantly by the lymphocyte. So the protein can be normal or slightly increased, but uh, there will be uh, normal glucose. So, but uh, there will be some contraindication on when uh, not to do the lumbar puncture. So the lumbar puncture cannot be done when the patient is uh, hemodynamically unstable and the Glasgow comma scale more, uh, less than eight the patient have abnormal dose eye reflect or unequal pupils, lateralized signs or abnormal posturing. And we cannot do the lumbar puncture immediately after the recent uh, seizure. So apart from the lumbar puncture, we can do the full blood count to check whether the patient, uh, pa to check for neutrophilia or lymphocytosis. So neutrophilia can suggest the patient uh, the causes is due to bacteria or lymphocytosis can be due to the viral causes. And we can also do the blood or uh, CSF culture to detect the etiological organism that may be present in the blood or uh, from the CSF. And like I said before, we can do the neuroimaging studies like MRI or CT scan. And we can find the diffuse cerebral swelling of the parenchyma of the brain. Uh, in the patient of the encephalitis and we can do the electro electroencephalogram EEG and uh, there will be slow wave activity or in HSV uh, infection there will be temporal lobe focal change and <clears throat> if CSF is contraindicated we can do PCR or antibody testing to establish the uh, infectious causes and next Okay, so for complication, we go with the meningitis first. So we can divide it into early complication or late complication. So for the CNS, uh, the patient can have the subdural effusion, uh, which is common in the hemophilus influenza, and uh, the cerebral excess when there is a deterioration of the patient's clinical condition, uh, whether with or without sign of space or vision. So for the vas vascular, the patient can have a disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, shock, and the syndrome of in inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, SIADH. So for the leg complication, the patient can have hydrocephalus uh, due to inflammatory obstruction of the CSF pathway, the subdural empyema, epilepsy, mental retardation, cerebral palsy or learning deficit, and the patient can have the hearing loss uh, which, uh, due to damage of the eight cranial nerve and the cochlear hair cell. So for the encephalitis, the symptom uh, usually resolve over several days or two or three weeks, and the most of the patient resolve without sequelae. 
and the complication uh, can be paralysis or spasticity, cognitive impairment, weakness, ataxia or recurrent seizure. Next. Okay, so uh, for the role of corticosteroid as the management. So in meningitis, uh, the we, uh, we use dexamethasone. So uh, there is a formula there. She is uh, whether 0 0.1 milligram per kg uh, every six hour for four days, or we can give a uh, four milligram per kg to, uh, every 12 hour for two days. So uh, let's say uh, I put the example, if the patient have uh, four kilogram, so uh, the dose uh, will be 0 0.6 milligram uh, every six hour for four days, or it can be 16 milligram uh, every 12 hour for two days. So this uh, steroid therapy can give is the CS, uh, we can see the CSF is the bit and the patient has not yet received uh, any antibiotics. So this, uh, Corticosteroid can improve the meningeal inflammation and reduce the hearing impairment as the complication. So, but for in encephalitis, uh, based on my reading, uh, some of the uh, doctors practice to give the corticosteroid, but it is uh, unclear whether it is uh, truly um, beneficial or not. But uh, uh, I found in the PITS protocol, we can give the uh, corticosteroid in autoimmune encephalitis as the first line. So, like we give the IV metipregnisolone, uh, 10 milligram per kg uh, every eight hours for five days, or we can give the intravenous oral um, omeprazole followed by the oral pregnisolone uh, together with the intravenous immunoglobulin. And uh, based on my reading, I, uh, I also find that. Uh, this corticosteroid can work as the supportive treatments uh, to reduce the intracranial pressure in encephalitis patient. So I think that's all for me. All right. Okay. Um, again, uh, quite good. Very good. Um, you don't have to remember the dose. Huh? Actually, uh, you want you to understand that actually for uh, corticosteroid, in evidence we said if you suspect meningitis, especially what type of meningitis? Nakudin. Uh, Corticosteroid is uh, more useful. Uh, bacterial meningitis. Yeah, with any specific organism in the data. Nigeria uh, meningitis, eh? So actually, uh, it's actually improved the, the, the inflammation and reduce hearing impairment. Eh? Okay, so you don't have to remember the dose. Eh? Not expected to remember the dose. Um, and rem remember that uh, meningitis and encephalitis can concurrently occur. Eh? So we call it meningoencephalitis. So it's not easy. So that's why uh, in this situation, sometimes uh, empirical treatment, you will start with antibiotic and antiviral initially. I say you will start antibiotic and after you start acyclovir uh, because the most common cause of uh, encephalitis is herpes simplex. Eh? So it's very common. You see in, in what people will be start, started on antibiotic and also IV acyclovir when you suspect meningoencephalitis. Okay. All right. So any question with, with relation to encephalitis and meningitis? Okay. We can, we can discuss again at the end as well. Okay. Next. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Ain Farhani Binti Hassan and I will present about the cerebral palsy. So first uh, for the introduction, cerebral palsy. Cerebral refers to the uh, cerebrum which is the affected area of the brain and palsy refers to brain injuries resultant disorder of movement which is uh, muscle weakness. So cerebral palsy defines a group of disorder that affects a person's ability to move and maintain balance and posture. CP is caused by abnormal brain developing or damage to the developing uh, brain that affects the person's ability to control his or her muscle. And it is more common cause of motor impairment in children 
and it is a permanent but not progressive uh, disease because it is a static disorder. Okay, uh, and next for the classification, the classification can be divided into three, which are motor function, topographical distribution, and gross motor function classification system. So first for the motor function, it further subdivided into spastic, dyskinetic, uh, attensive, and mis type of uh, cerebral palsy. So basically for the motor function, uh, it depends on the which area of the brain is affected. So first for the spastic uh, cerebral palsy, which is the common cause of cerebral palsy, it arises from the mortal cortex damage. And next uh, is the dyskinetic uh, cerebral palsy, it arises from the basal ganglia damage, and for the ecstasy, it arises from the cerebellum damage. And for the mixed type, it can be the combination of uh, those cerebral types. And next uh, classification is topographical distribution, which is depends on the area of the body is affected. So under spastic, there is hemiplegia, diplegia, and quadriplegia. So for the spastic hemiplegia, the area affected is one side of the body. And for the spastic diplegia, the area affected can be both leg and both arm, but the most uh, common is both leg. And for the spastic quadriplegia, it's a, a more severe form of spastic uh, cerebral palsy. And next, uh, under dyskinetic, uh, there is also uh, atetoid and dystonic, uh, which is it is uh, has involuntary and uncontrolled movement. And for the atesia, it has atesic uh, cerebral palsy, which is it has poor coordination and poor uh, balance. So for the atesia uh, cerebral palsy, the patient can work, but uh, in unsteady manner because they have poor uh, poor balance and poor coordination. And next for gross motor function classification system, which is based on the severity and the mobility of the uh, disorder. So it has five levels. So the first level is uh, the walk without limitation, which is uh, the child can walk and can run, but uh, there is a uh, limited to the speed and balance. And when the child wants to climb the child, the stair, uh, then they, uh, they do not need uh, to use uh, things to support our assistance, such as the railing. And the next uh, level is uh, level two. Uh, the child uh, can walk, but when uh, the child wants to climb the stair, they need uh, something to assist or to support them, such as the railing along the stair. And next uh, classification uh, is level three, which is a walk. Uh, but using the hand uh, device, uh, such as use the wheelchair. And next, uh, for the level four, is also a uh, use device, but it, uh, it's like a, uh, what we call a electrical uh, wheelchair. And as you can see, uh, there is head and body support for the wheelchair. And next, for the uh, level five, it is, the, uh, it is no limitation. They need other persons to help them. Okay, uh, and next for the phytophysiology of the uh, cerebral palsy, the etiology of the cerebral palsy can be many causes uh, during antenatal, perinatal, and during also postnatal, but it is most common uh, during uh, antenatal. So for the, uh, the prematurity is also the risk factor for the cerebral palsy. So uh, for the uh, prematurity, it has undeveloped neonate brain. So it can expose to uh, intraventricular hemorrhage and uh, anatomical factors such as uh, periventricular water shed zone and immature uh, autoregulatory mechanism will uh, predispose to ischemic or hypoxia. And next, uh, if there is any infection or inflammation, the cellular factors such as cytokine, uh, reactive oxygen species, and uh, excitotoxin via uh, glutamate will uh, target the premyelinating or oligodendrocyte and then interfere with the myelination of the white matter and that can cause uh, PVL, which is uh, periventricular leukomanesia and PVL has a high risk to get the uh, cerebral palsy. Okay, next, uh, for the clinical features, so the early features of uh, cerebral palsy are as follows, which is uh, docility and irritability, has poor feeding, abnormal reflex, abnormal muscle tone, and asymmetric movement pattern. And you can compare between the uh, normal motor development and abnormal motor development. 
Okay. And next, so this is the clinical features for the types, uh, for the specific types of cerebral palsy. So for the spastic, it's basically uh, on the motor neuron, which is a uh, persistent primitive reflex, hypotonia, seizure gait, equinovirus, deformity of foot, windscreen deformity, and tremor. For the disconnected, it has uh, with, uh, to do with the uh, involuntary and uncontrolled movement, such as clinical features, uh, usually symmetrical, abnormal slow, right thin movement, constant involuntary, uncontrolled movement, floppiness, has poor trunk control and delay movement, delay motor development. And for the ataxic, it has a poor uh, coordinate and balance. So uh, the signs occur on the same, uh, at the same, at the same time at the lesion. So the early uh, signs can be trunk and limb hypotonies poor balance, uh, delay motor development, and the latter can be in coordinate movement and impair eye movement control and depth perception. Okay, uh, next is the diagnosis and investigation. For the diagnosis of cerebral palsy, it is uh, clinically diagnosed, which is uh, based on the symptom itself, and such as abnormal gait posture. And then uh, we can do also screening to diagnose uh, cerebral palsy. We can do a developmental monitoring, which is uh, we will track the child score over the time. And if the if it doesn't meet the established uh, developmental uh, delay, uh, uh, developmental standard, we can further do developmental screening, which is a short test to know the cause of a developmental delay, either it is a movement or motor. And next, uh, if the result of the developmental screening is a uh, cause and we is uh, abnormal and we need to refer to the developmental and medical evaluation. And the next investigation is uh, imaging studies uh, such as uh, EEG and brain MRI. And as you can see in the table uh, shown, uh, it shows the uh, cerebrum of the cerebral palsy, which is uh, categorized by the uh, enlarged ventricle and a diminished volume of a white matter. Okay, and next for the management and the prognosis. So for the management of cerebral palsy, basically there is no corrective treatment and the treatment aims to increase the quality of life. And we will do it by do multidisciplinary team approach, uh, which is done by child development service. So uh, basically uh, this is the example of the uh, MDT, which is a medical to give muscle relax, such as we use Dazepan or Baclofen and we'll reduce Spasticity or disabled distant movement. And then we can do a uh, psychiatry, which is uh, for psychological and social problems, education for so uh, school and intellectual uh, progress, rehabilitation for the physiotherapy and speech therapy, and external aid such as wheelchair and echo foot orthosis to support the leg. And the prognosis uh, for cerebral palsy, it depends based on the pattern of evolving signs and child development uh, progress. Okay, next for the, the role of Botox in uh, cerebral palsy, uh, botil uh, botulinum toxin A is an anti spasticity medication that can be ejected into muscles to temporarily reduce unwanted muscle tightness in a person with severe cerebral palsy, improving their comfort and movement. And occupational therapy or physiotherapy after the injections can further improve outcomes and bolitinic toxin A can also be called by the trade names, including Botox and Dispot. So basically for the uh, Botox in uh, cerebral palsy, it's uh, for the anti spasticity uh, drug to uh, relax the uh, muscle uh, for uh, cerebral palsy patient. So uh, I think that's all from me. Okay, again, very good. Um, you can actually uh, find out uh, the video of uh, you know the type the how uh this kinetic kinetic eh, of a uh, movement of a uh, cerebral child and also you can look into the video how botox has uh, improved uh, uh movement in in uh, child with cerebral palsy you can look at the short video and so that you can appreciate it now in your free time just uh, look at it any question related to uh, cerebral palsy very clear, quite clear, especially the classification. Eh? Um, again, uh, the classification, especially the um, topographic classification, 
is the one that uh, usually you 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 will uh, see or be or you will be asked uh, what type of uh, uh, spasticity the child has, and remember that again is a uh, non-progressive condition. Again, this is a question that normally we ask you in your end of question assessment. Okay, clear. Okay, no question. Next, sir. Last one, is it? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Okay, can everyone see my slide? Yes. Okay, okay, um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, my name is Rita Pekas Rudin, and I'll be presenting about the muscular dystrophy. So, this is my table of contents. So, we start with the uh, general, uh, uh, the whole uh, topic, which is muscle dystrophy, and then we move to the Duchenne, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and then the third one will be going to the evidence based medicine. So, uh, first we start with the definition of the muscular dystrophy. So, basically, uh, as you can read from the slide, a group of inherited muscle disorders characterized by progressive and definite degeneration and death of muscle fibers without central or peripheral nerve abnormality. So basically, in muscular dystrophy, you um, uh, bear in mind there are, there are four elements that need to be remembered. The first one is that this uh, disease is inherited disease. This is the first one, and in the second one, it is uh, it is a primary myopathy, which means that the disease solely because of the uh, dysfunctional of the muscles without any abnormality on the nervous system. That is second, and then for the third, this disease is progressive degeneration which means that it will occur from birth until uh, and it can lead to the death. And the fourth one, uh, it, uh, at a uh, certain point, it will become the definite de degeneration in which the muscles uh, will be replaced by the fibrotic and also the fat tissues. And this can cause death of the muscle fibers and hence can lead to the, um, uh, the person cannot uh, use uh, their muscles anymore. And they can be in, uh, they are wheelchair dependent. And then the next, we move to the types of the muscular dystrophy. So generally, there are nine major types of muscular dystrophies, and it is classified in three groups. So the first one will be the set splint group, which involves the mutation of the chromosome X, uh, which involves the uh, Duchenne, which will be discussed in detail today. And then for Becker, Becker is actually the same as Duchenne, except that. Becker has mild clinical features compared to the Duchenne. And then uh, in Emery Dreyfus, so Emery Dreyfus, uh, you can see that the muscles affected uh, in uh, Duchenne and Becker are uh, usually uh, at the hip, at the hip and then at the leg, uh, and also uh, at the arms and the shoulders. And it can sometimes reach uh, to the spine. And then for Emery Dreyfus, uh, usually it will involve only the distal leg at the calves and then at the shoulder girdle and sometimes at, uh, up to the arms. And then we move to the autosomal dominant, which involves this facial scapulohumeral, involves the face and then the shoulder and uh, also the humerus, uh, the arms, and then also involves the distal leg at the calf. And then for the distal, uh, distal is easy because it involves the distal limbs. And then for the oculopharyngeal, uh, oculopharyngeal, it will involve uh, the muscles uh, around the, our eyes and then at the hips and at the shoulders as well as at the arm. Uh, for the myotonic, it is not included in this picture. However, for myotonic, uh, generally, uh, uh, we have to remember that myotonic involves the weakening of all the muscles, including the central nervous system. So, and then the next, we move to the autosomal recessive disorder uh, in muscular dystrophies, which involve the limb girdle form, let us see. So limb girdle form, uh, the name is set at the, at the limb here, at the arm, and then at the girdle, which is at the girdle hips, also at this uh, girdle shoulder. And then for the, and then congenital, it is not included in this picture, but what differs from the congenital muscular dystrophy among the other eight muscular dystrophies is that this congenital occur uh, during birth and also it 
it involves brain compared to the others. Uh, the others may also involve the brain, but in congenital, it is more aggressive. So it can lead to the uh, uh, intellectual impairment in uh, baby and also can lead to death. So next, we move to the uh, details in Duchenne, mus uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So uh, first, we have to understand the basic concept of the Duchenne. So Duchenne is the most common type of the muscular dystrophy with the incidence of one in 3,600 life-born male infants. So the gene mutation occurred at the chromosome X at the locus of the XP21 which results in the deletion of the short arm of chromosome X and hence there will be shortening of the, of the protein that is encoded and the protein that this, uh, uh, this, this gene encoded is dystrophin. So why is dystrophin? So before we uh, understand the pathophysiology, we have to understand the physiology of the dystrophin. So as you can see at the first picture, so this one is the dystrophin. So in our muscles, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, myocytes, the tubular, tubular myocytes. And if we uh, further uh, zoom into this uh, myocyte, uh, we have the myocyte membrane, and then this one is inside the myocytes, and then this one is outside myocyte. So on the myocyte membrane, we have the dystroglycan complex. So the dystroglycan complex, it is attached to the extracellular matrix. Well, for the dystrophin, dystrophin is a protein. And then this dystrophin, uh, it has three parts, which is the first one is actin binding end, which is attached to the actin cytoskeleton of the myocytes, and then the central rod to maintain the flexibility of the protein. And then the third one is dystroglycan binding end. So this dystroglycan binding end will attach to the dystroglycan complex and has this dystrophin, it acts as the linkage between the actin cytoskeleton of the myocytes and the extracellular matrix. So what is the importance is that? Uh, the importance is that when the muscles contract, it will prevent from the damage of the membrane. So in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, when there is mutation at the XP21 locus of the chromosome X and there will be deletion, uh, of the uh, deletion of the short arm of this chromosome X has the this dystrophin will not fully translated and usually and the usual side it will be at the dystrophin binding end the one that will be uh, deleted and because of that this dystrophin is non-functional is a dysfunctional and hence it cannot uh, do it works to protect the uh, membrane when the muscles contract so what happens, so when the muscles contract, there will be small rips on the membrane. And this will cause, uh, will uh, allow a lot of ions, a lot of small molecules to enter or even to uh, exit uh, from the membrane. So uh, among, the, among the ions that can uh, be transported through this membrane is that first one is extracellular calcium. When there is an uh, influx, which means the calcium ions will be, uh, will be entering inside the myocytes. And what will happen is that when there is, uh, there is calcium ions, it will bind to the inactivate protease. So protease, the function of the protease is actually to, um, uh, it is uh, functioning to, uh, it is will bind to the old and also dysfunctional protein and hence it will uh, delete that protein. However, in this Duchenne muscular dystrophy, when there is excessive uh, calcium uh, influx of the calcium ions and excessive of the binding of the uh, protease that can lead to excessive of activated protease, it will lead to this binding of the protease to the functional protein. And when there is binding to this functional protein, it will lead to the muscle proteolysis because this protein has been destroyed. And among, uh, besides uh, calcium, there will be also efflux of the creatine kinase. So creatine kinase, we know uh, it is originated from the muscles. So when there is a uh, ribs of the membrane, the creatine kinase will be uh, uh, going outside to the myocyte. And hence, this will lead to the further muscles weakening because creatine kinase, the function is to store the energy whenever the muscles is contract. So when there is no energy, so there will be less in muscle contraction and can cause the muscles weakening. So uh, 
generally uh, there there will be a regeneration of the myocytes however when the patient become uh, older uh, let's say like the patient entering the uh, five years old or six years old there will be like uh, the destruction of the myocyte is too much hence the regeneration cannot occur and this will lead to the uh, replacement of the fibrotic and fat tissues and this can cause the definite uh, definite and uh, this can cause the uh, definite degradation of the muscles and can cause uh, the further weak, uh, the permanent weakening of the muscles. Okay, so next we move to the clinical features of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So uh, in clinical features, uh, basically uh, it is rarely symptom symptomatic for the baby who just born or even in the early infancy. And usually for this Duchenne MD to have the clinical onset, it is usually on the when the uh, patient is uh, at the age of two to three years old. And we can see that uh, when the patient, like uh, among the other peers, uh, uh, they become like uh, slow in learning or slow in uh, motor development, or if there is any mental impairment or uh, uh, delay in the speech and language and so on. So uh, clinical features of addition, uh, muscular dystrophy can be divided into three phases. So the first phase is usually five to six years when there will be uh, this distinctive of the clinical features. So the first one will be the Trader-Lambert, or we call it as the Wedding gate, or we call it as a, a like uh, a duck duck like gait, uh, because the patient uh, appear to uh, walk like because the patient appear to walk like a duck. Uh, and then uh, this is uh, due to uh, weaknesses of the gluteus maximus as well as gluteus gluteus uh, minimus, and uh, this is uh, this can cause the uh, the patient uh, will be having the over overbearing hip, which means that the gluteus uh, the gluteus muscles cannot hold the pelvic, and hence it will like a tilting. So that is why the patient will walk like a tilting side to the side in order to stabilize to the center of the gravity. So that is the treadle lumbar gait. And then the second one will be the lordotic posture. Lordotic posture occur when there is um, uh, weaknesses in uh, hip flexors, uh, which is uh, gluteus maximus as well as the uh, hamstrings muscles. And because of that, uh, there will be tilting of the pelvis at the front in order to balance the patient because the weaknesses of the muscle is at the back. So the, uh, the pelvis will be tilted at the uh, the pelvis will be tilted to the front in order to balance the patient. And then uh, gradually, uh, when there is uh, like uh, unstable walk, unstable to stand. Uh, the patient will uh, will have frequent falls without tripping or stumbling and even have the problems of getting up from sitting or sitting position and this can cause the goal sign. So you can see from this uh, moving picture that the patient, you can see that the patient sort of, they crawl, they are in the crawl position and then they will crawl backward and up to their body in order to stand up. And this is due to the weaknesses of the muscles, especially at the hip muscles. So that is the sign that we have to look, especially in patient in Duchenne's muscle dystrophy. And the fourth one will be the toe walking because uh, the, uh, the patient find it uh, easier to uh, work on the equinous foot compared to the uh, uh, flat foot. And then in second phase, which is around seven to 13 years, uh, majority of the patient may have loss of ambulation. Loss of ambulation means that the patient will no longer can walk and no longer can use their muscles as usual and hence the patient can be bound to wheelchair and this process can even occur as early as six years old in some patients. And also when there is loss of ambulation, there will be consequences in which there will be rapidly progressive cause of muscle or tendon contractures and also scoliosis. In addition to the findings, there will also uh, be uh, the patient will have calf pseudo hypertrophy, which means the enlargement of the calf due to uh, fibrotic and fat tissue uh, displacement at the muscles. And then there will be wasting of tight muscles and macrobosia, which uh, the there will be hypertrophy uh, of the tongue. The tongue will become large, 
And then in some patients, they'll have pain in calves with activity. And for progressive cardiomyopathy, uh, this is due to, uh, uh, this is because uh, this trophin is also in uh, uh, cardiac muscles as well as in brain and retina. So when there is, uh, just like I mentioned in the photo, there might be myocardial fibrosis and this can cause the cardiomyopathy. And then intellectual impairment, uh, because the dystrophin uh, is also expressed in brain, it can cause uh, the patient to have like unable to uh, delay in uh, talk or even in writing uh, and so on. So next we move to the investigation and diagnosis of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So for the investigation, uh, usually uh, based on the photogenesis just now, we know that the creatinine kinase from the muscle has escaped to the uh, blood, to the, to, our, uh, to the patient's blood. Hence, there will be elevated in serum creatinine kinase level. And it can elevate it 50 to 300 times than normal, normal level of the uh, serum creatinine kinase level, which uh, the normal will be like below 160 IU per liter. And then uh, usually for uh, the patient will have uh, around uh, 5,000 to 35,000 IU per liter. So it is greatly elevated in the patient. And we can also see elevated in aldolase and aspartate aminotransferase level as this is as this uh, enzymes is actually the lysosomal enzymes in the muscles. However, because it is also expressed in the liver, hence it is less specific because it can also be detected in the liver dysfunction. And then for the imaging, uh, imaging uh, usually uh, we will use the ultrasonography. So ultrasonography can detect uh, there is uh, a increase in echogenicity in the affected muscles and this is due to fat replacement. And because of increase in echogenicity of the muscles, there will be corresponding decrease in underlying bone echo. So which means that we cannot see the bone so much because of the fat uh, displacement. And then for other tests such as uh, ECG, uh, we monitor for the cardiac, uh, for the heart, and then for the EMG. So uh, EMG, uh, it can show the uh, myopathic features. However, it is almost never used for the diagnosis because it is not specific because when you have the uh, myotrophic features, it can be any disease that involves the muscular disease. So it is not specific. And then uh, biopsy. Biopsy is actually the definite diagnosis for the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So usually we take the biopsy on the affected muscles and hence it will, uh, when there is a HPE stain, it will reveal the results of there will be, uh, as you see in the picture, there will be like a uh, scattered degenerative myofibers compared to the normal. Normal, we see that uh, it is consistent in, like uh, almost consistent in shape, the myofibers. However, in this affected one, uh, some, uh, some is small, some is big. So it, it shows that there is the, some degenerative of the myofibers. And then uh, it also have uh, endomysial connective tissue proliferation. As well as, as well as infiltration of mononuclear inflammatory cells due to cell necrosis, cell death uh, due to definite degeneration. And then there will be also a collection of the dense fibers. And then for the genetic testing, uh, genetic testing uh, is also one of the uh, diagnosis of the Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy. Usually we use the PCR and we want to look for if there is any mutation of the dystrophy gene. So for diagnostic con confirmation is that uh, obviously we will uh, look for the uh, clinical features in history of presenting illness. And then um, we will also look for the elevation of the serum creatinine kinase level, which is 50 to 300 times. And then um, uh, especially uh, in patient, uh, when patient have the family history of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, like for example, uh, the patient, uh, he has a brother who has uh, diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So usually when we make a diagnosis of this, the same disease, we will take the uh, clinical features of the patient uh, and the elevation of the serum creatinine kinase. No need to further into genetic testing and muscle biopsy. However, if the patient is the first case in, the, uh, in his family, 
uh, the further uh, investigation is needed, which is genetic testing for this protein mutation. And for further confirmation, we do the muscle biopsy. And then the next, uh, so we move to the complications of the Duchenne muscle dystrophy. So this complication is actually the third or the last phase of the clinical features of the Duchenne muscle dystrophy. So what occurs is that uh, when there is like progression of the weakening of the muscle, eventually it will lead to the muscle's contractures. Muscle contracture is due to fibrotic replacement in, in which that the muscles cannot be contracted and hence the patient cannot move. So there will be like contract, contracture. The, as you can see at the patient, uh, you can see at the arm and at the hand, like this is a contracture. And then the patient will have early wheelchair dependence because the muscles cannot be used. Hence, the patient need wheelchair. And therefore, osteoporosis and fractures. So in osteoporosis, and, uh, so in osteoporosis it is mainly due to two uh, causes. The first one is that uh, the progression of the uh, muscle, weak, uh, weakening of the muscles can cause the uh, decrease in bone strength because of immobilization. And the second one is due to uh, usage of the glucocorticoid in the Duchenne muscle dystrophy therapy because glucocorticoid, the adverse effect will be the osteoporosis. I will be explained later in the management. And then for the fractures, uh, usually uh, because the bone strength has uh, decreased, it can lead to fractures, even small hit. Because uh, but usually patient complain fractures, uh, it is usually to fall, falling. And then for the third one is scoliosis. Uh, scoliosis, as I mentioned, scoliosis will occur when there is loss of ambulation. So scoliosis is actually the uh, lateral dis displacement of the spine. And scoliosis can lead to the pulmonary, impaired in pulmonary function because when there is like a lateral uh, displacement of this vertebral bodies, it can somehow alter the ribcage. And when, the, when there is abnormality of the uh, thoracic ribcage, uh, the the, uh, when there is abnormality of the ribcage, there will be uh, abnormality of the thoracic cavity itself. And hence, uh, there, will, there might be compression of the organs such as uh, the lung, and, and, and there will be compression of the respiratory muscles. And that is why scoliosis can cause the pulmonary uh, dysfunction. And then the front one is cardiopulmonary failure. Because as I mentioned just now, due to progression of the myocardial fibrosis and progression from the scoliosis, it can lead to cardiopulmonary failure, and eventually the patient may die. So usually, uh, for the uh, for the patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, they the uh, you, globally it is rarely to see the survivor at the uh, at the third decade. Usually before the third decade, uh, they will die. And then for the uh, management of the uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the first one, uh, uh, basically for management of this Duchenne, it has no definitive cure. And we just uh, treat patient by supportive care and also with preventive care in order to increase the quality life of the patient. And the first one will prescribe with the glucocorticoids uh, such as uh, prednisone and deflazacoid. So glucocorticoids function is to actually glucocorticoids may delay the onset of the loss of the ambulation and also can prevent from it, it not prevent, it can delay the progression of the scoliosis. Uh, however, glucocorticoids is associated with the uh, adverse effect, just as mentioned, like osteoporosis, weight gain, uh, cataracts, acne, and even delay in puberty. And then the second one uh, for cardiac care. So cardiac care, uh, we uh, the doctor will give uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. And if the ECG of the patient shows that there is no improvement in around three months, uh, beta blockers will be prescribed. And then uh, for the treatment of pulmonary infections, because as I mentioned, the complications uh, will be the impaired in the lung function. So there will be, uh, the patient may have no, uh, uh, cannot cough to, uh, to expel uh, any organism that enter uh, the patient's airway and hence uh, they need uh, the assisted devices such as uh, nebulizers. And also uh, 
we avoid the patient from uh, contacting with uh, with children that are uh, that have the contagious illness. And then the third is nutritional step preservation. Uh, uh, we give the uh, calcium D as well as calcium and vitamin D for the osteoporosis as well as the dietary restriction with supervision if the patient is obese. And the physiotherapy, it is included in rehabilitation. So physiotherapy, usually it will delays. It will not prevent, but it will delays the progression of the contractures, of the muscle contractures. So the uh, specialist uh, will uh, let the patient wear uh, having the stretching and bracing methods. And then uh, the six will be the monitoring of the progressive scoliosis, such as uh, there will be uh, usage of the external braces and also corsets by the uh, orthopedist. And then, okay, so now we move to the gene therapy for Duchenne MD. So we, we, okay, so gene therapy uh, is actually an experimental technique for treating the disease by altering the patient's genetic material. So often, uh, it works by introducing a healthy copy of a defective gene into the patient's cell. So how this works? So in Duchenne MD, just as we discussed in the uh, pathogenesis, there is a deletion of the uh, half of the dystrophin and hence the dystrophin will be dysfunctional. So uh, the experts have discussed that the, the dystrophin is best if we replace the, this, the new dystrophin inside the patient. So hence, it is dystrophin replacement strategy. It is the direct method by introducing the new dystrophin into the patient. And uh, when we want to, uh, when the experts want to introduce this new dystrophin, they need to have uh, a new, they need to have like a vector, a vehicle, in order to be transported to the muscle. So the best uh, that they found is the adenovirus associated vector, which uh, can be altered, the gene can be altered, and it can be uh, transferred into the patient's body. And then there will be transferring of the, uh, the protein itself into the uh, patient's muscles, and the dystrophin can work as usual. So, uh, However, the problem is that uh, this trophy is larger compared to the uh, AAV. So because of that, there is development of the micro dystrophin that will be transported with AAV vector mediated uh, delivery. So uh, the one problem is that when it is micro dystrophin, it will not have the optimized function. Hence, uh, the uh, the, the therapy, the gene therapy must be done um, quite a few number in order to achieve uh, the optimization uh, of the uh, gene replacement. The advantages of this uh, method is that uh, it is able to deliver the genes to the skeletal and cardiac muscles body-wide. And also, uh, it is able to optimize the micro dystrophins to help the muscle degeneration. And one more thing, because the microdystrophin is needed to be prescribed, uh, is needed to be uh, given always, is that because uh, myo because myocytes will eventually uh, degenerate and then will be regenerate. So it needs a new dystrophin always. So that is why the experts uh, need to introduce a lot more this microdystrophin. And also, uh, AAV vector has a safety profile uh, because uh, AAV, uh, based on my research, is that they said that they have the low pathogenicity, pathogenicity as well as low toxicity after being altered uh, into the new gene to be inserted into the patient. However, when this vector associated, uh, when this vector is inserted, is and is and is inserted in into the patient's body, there will be immunological reactions because uh, our immune system will recognize that this factor is foreign body. So they will try to attack, they will have like uh, cytotoxic lymphocyte reaction, there will be complement activation that can cause the uh, destruction, not only to the uh, vector, but also to the degeneration muscle. So it may deteriorate the patient's condition. And because of that, uh, the experts 
uh, have found that there are several methods, but uh, still it is under research. However, there are several methods are now that if the patient has pre-existing immunity towards the AAV, so the vector prescription must be the another serotype, which means that, if, uh, for example, like initially, it is given serotype 1, and then the patient has antibody against the serotype 1. So the expert will give another serotype, uh, another from the serotype 1. And also, uh, the patient may undergo the plasma paralysis in order to reduce uh, the level of the uh, serotype, uh, uh, the, uh, the level of the neutralization uh, antibodies. And then uh, if, if there is successful gene transfer inside the patient's body, so it will obviously lead to development of the immunological reactions. Hence, uh, the experts will usually use the transient immunosuppression uh, in order to block uh, the uh, cytotoxic uh, lymphocyte reaction. And also there will be, uh, the experts may also deliver the microotrophin. So microotrophin is basically the uh, surrogate vector. And this surrogate vector, uh, it, is, it is not foreign to the patient's body uh, for some reasons. Okay, uh, I think, so this is my references. Uh, that is all from me, so thank you. All right, uh, hopefully this uh, can open up uh, some ideas uh, for, for you. A certain genetic condition, hopefully some of you be clinician scientists. Uh. Some uh, genetic condition, uh, there's a role of uh, uh, genetic therapy. So many uh, genetic condition at the moment, people are looking into the treatment based on uh, genetic therapy. Uh, okay, uh, very good, uh, clear, and then I think the video of the goal sign and also uh, what is a warning gate is uh, hopefully useful. Eh? Uh, are you guys uh, uh, going to hospital already? Double uh? hospital? Uh? Is it? Uh, you guys allowed to go to hospital now? No. Oh no! All right. So none of you uh, can go to your AOHTA, is it? None of us can go. All right. Now. So um, after this uh, presentation, eh, please uh, make sure that uh, you look into uh, a question as well. Eh? Especially topic based uh, question, uh, you have you have to do a uh, question in order to to know that you understand or not. Either MCQ ke single best answer. I look into the the the, the essay question, right? Um, otherwise, you think that you understand, but the moment you look at the uh, you given the question, eh, was the exam ke apa nanti tak boleh jawab. You gonna have to look uh, so resources for for question, okay? All right. So, any any uh, question uh, related to this uh, discussion that we had uh, this uh, tonight? I think very good uh, presentation. Uh. I think uh, see uh, this one is better than uh, listening to to to, to lecture. Lah. I don't give lecture because you guys are uh, doing a quite 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 well job. Lah. So, third question. Any question? Right, tadi we end up lah. Tak ada lagi soal as. Alright, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. And uh, nanti group leader, please uh, email. I uh, give you my email. Email me the all the uh, slide presentation. Eh? Okay. Okay, insyaallah. Alright, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, okay, doctor. Alright, okay, doctor. Okay, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Yeah.